acoustically that's just the way it works. You have to have the piccolo playing in unison with the, the glock because having both of them way up there activating that top register is what makes that magic sound on the top. But that's not enough because you have to have the, the harmony below it or it won't work. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is like a magic formula and, or you know, a spell if you, you, or a recipe. You have to have all the ingredients or it doesn't taste right. But, right. but he also notice he picks the four most strident instruments. He's got piccolo, mm -hmm. he's got flute in the stratosphere, and he's got oboe and E flat clarinet. Each uh, one of those instruments is going to cut. Don't forget the xylophone. <laughs> oh, right. I'm sorry. That'll, I'm sorry, that'll cut the sh. And you can see what he's playing. He's playing the melody. Yup, up, yup, and up. Yeah, and the pits and the, the strings, just like kind of a, it's almost like a color, just adding right. to what everyone else is doing there. Uh, and our uh, our good old friend Woodwind Helper, the piano, up oh, yeah. in the top up, up octaves. A million of miles yeah. up in the yeah right. And you know who I think was uh, a real pioneer in that kind of orchestration was Stravinsky. He would have uh, a, a full orchestra chord, and he'd have one two instruments. I mean, literally, out of you know the eighty member orchestra, they're playing the third, and it sounds balanced. Right. And let's uh, take a listen to what's going on there with the solo trumpet because this is uh, this is classic big band writing in the context of uh, a symphony orchestra. And it's almost like having Maynard Ferguson in the band. <laughs> yeah, except with the shakes and all of that type of thing. Except Maynard would take it up another octave. Yeah, he would go up. He'd, yeah, he'd, he'd leave town up there. And my father was, in fact, when he came back from Berlin and Budapest, he was. Um, concertmaster for Alfred Newman for one year. And he was uh, so intimidated by Alfred Newman that he <laughs> left that job and he went across the street or wherever and he went over to MGM, Johnny Green, and said, um, I'm Alfred Newman's concertmaster, do you have a job for me? <laughs> <laughs> and so for the next 15 or 20 years, he was second chair at MGM. During this very first uh, session with him, the, the Gloria, I went up to him and I said, Maestro, I, I, you know, I'm so sorry, I've never studied voice. And he said, don't ever study. It ruined your perfect boy alto <laughs> voice. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of uh, just a personal relationship, when I was working on the four Russian songs for flute, harp and guitar. Um, I had to do it in, in Russian. And uh, <laughs> so I was sent the phonetic translation um, on a tape from New York. And I went to the maestro's house. He lived up Weatherly Drive. I mean, he and I were sitting at the dining room table as close as you and I'm closer than you and I are. And I'm saying, Tilimbom, Tilimbom, Zaga Yelsa, Koezi Dom. I remember that. This is very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> he had no complaints. He had no complaints. But I don't know how much vodka he had had. Or <laughs> Actually, it was scotch. Actually, it was scotch. He loved scotch. And he, he uh, smoked, I think it was either four or five packs of Galois a day. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And while I was in New York, I was, as part of a, a quartet, I, uh, I worked with uh, Gunther Schiller on his uh, Quartetto Quattronino, I think it was called. And I sat in the middle of the LA Phil, I mean the New York Phil, right, with Gunther conducting. And I was one of four singers, and we each had a microphone. And he had the orchestra set up, so I had a trumpet on one side and a viola on the other. And, you know, we were all spread out all around the place. But, uh, I mean, it was just, that was then. It was extraordinary.